Welcome to Movies We Can Learn From on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Hitler and the Nazis, Evil on Trial, a gripping Netflix docuseries that examines Adolf Hitler and the Nazis, the rise, the rule, and the reckoning. Our guest for this show, this movie review, is George Kaysen, mm -hmm. our favorite movie reviewer. Welcome to the show, George. So, George, you know, give us a thumbnail of what this is about. It's a very ambitious six-part series yes. covering, hmm, gee, epical decades. Six episodes, six-part series, and they get in first into the Nuremberg trials, and then they work back through from 1920s, 19-teens, Hitler's life. It's done by Joseph Joe Berlinger, who is a documentary filmmaker who's done a lot of different things with crime and stuff. We also reviewed that whole Armenian thing, the Intent for Destroy, which you and I reviewed one of his previous productions in a docu-series, right, for the Armenian thing. So he's really good. He's done a lot of work. He's 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 gotten some, some awards, you know. So you, you've got this phenomenal, what they've done is they've taken some of the vintage filming and they've colorized it, which makes it more realistic. And it's all through the eyes of William Shirer, who was a reporter, a new US reporter, who was literally there up until 1940, from the early 30s to 1940, in Nazi Germany and, and documenting everything that was going on, even though some things he didn't really realize until later. And the thing that's the key point here is what he did. He was able, when they told him to finally leave in 1940, he was able to hide all his notes in a suitcase underneath the, that they didn't, they, if they found that they would have either jailed him or executed him. So once he had those notes, that's where he was able to write his book, Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And a lot of that documentation helped with the Nuremberg trials. Really fascinating to watch it. Why? Not because it, it, it covered the rise and fall, but it be, the, because it covered the rise and fall in ways that were different mm -hmm. than what we have seen during our life. Now, after all, you know, there have been movies and books and what have you, you know, since the war, mm -hmm. examining Hitler and the Nazis and what happened in Germany. Mm -hmm. But this was a little different. Um, this had footage we haven't seen before. Yeah, yeah. And it examined Hitler's rise to power in a way we haven't thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Berlinger's showcasing of the rise of Hitler and the Nazis gives rise actually now these days to a comparison with current events, with the move to the right, the move to autocracy, the move to dictatorship and totalitarianism yeah. happening, you know, potentially here in the United States, happening in Latin America, happening in a number of countries in, in Europe, especially Russia, but there are others too, like Hungary, yeah. um, happening in, in China. So this, this is kind of remarkable. You take this ordinary stunk who wants to be a painter, but has no talent, and somehow he gets to run Germany. How did he do that? He was in Austria trying to paint, and next thing you see is he's insinuated himself into the German government and the Weimar Republic and the Reichstag burns and all the things we've seen and heard for years and years. And then when he, somewhere along the line, he gets to be in charge. And it is that part that fascinated me most um, because he, he, he went down um, a, a chain of events uh, a series of moves that got him into that position. And it's haunting. You know, uh, it, it involves uh, Goebbels, uh, who was a, you know, a, a, a slight man, uh, at least according to this rendition, um, as the chief propagandist for the party. And he was very important. You know, then as now, propaganda is very important to an autocrat. Um, and how Hitler groomed himself to assume antics and modus operandi uh, that led to his rise in power. Step by step, he was more powerful. Step by step, people listened to him. Step by step, he changed the way the German people thought and acted. 
Um, his methods of garnering personal support are eerily similar to those of a key figure of our age in this election year, namely Donald Trump. It's almost that it really meant something to Donald Trump um, to have Mein Kampf uh, on his uh, bedstand. Yes. And uh, I don't know if he really read it, because I don't think he reads much, um, but he got something out of it anyway. He got these step-by-step -step maneuvers that Hitler used um, to take over Germany. What it shows you is that you can do it, that, that if, if you have the right personality and the right drive uh, and the right, mm, I don't know, some kind of uh, propagandist people around you, you can actually emerge as, as a, a dictator in a democratic country. Remember that the Weimar Republic was a democratic country, but he took advantage just the way Trump does. He, he criticized it. He told people it wasn't working. He told people that where everything was wrong with it, and he alone would fix it. I mean, does this sound familiar? Very. And so, what what will we learn from this movie? I mean, I, and and Berlinger really wanted to teach us this. Uh, what he, we learn from this movie is you can change a perfectly democratic society into a dictatorship, a murderous dictatorship, um, following certain steps, and. That's why Mein Kampf is so valuable. That's why a study of Hitler is so valuable. That's why this movie is so valuable. He intended to show us that. It wasn't directly aimed at Trump, but the you know the parallels are inevitable, irresistible. The whole thing with Goebbels, who literally trained Hitler into these antics, into words, into what really molded him to become this this leader, right? Because he was just a painter, you know? He, it was Goebbels that, that molded him. I've seen a interview with Trump, with Rona Barrett back in the early 80s, right? And Trump was so different. I mean, he was, you know, he's a real estate developer, whatever. Somebody or himself has changed him. These antics, these crazy things he comes up with, you know, to get press to write about him. They say sometimes bad press or good press, it's always good for a candidate because it brings them into focus, you know, then people know about him. But he's changed. So somewhere along the line, either by himself or with some training, he became the Trump that we know today, right? So different than what he was like 40 years, 35, 40 years ago. So there's, there's this whole thing with Goebbels, right? As you said, the propagandists, and all these autocrats, they do. They, it's all propaganda. I, I mean, I read things every day, how these autocrats, propaganda, how, how they twist the facts to their benefit, right? So there's, there's, there's so much of that. And when you go through the trials, the Nuremberg problem, it starts in the first episode, but then at the end, it gets into detail. Some of these Nazis, they still they would admit what they did. I mean, they still believe that they were right and they keep blaming Hitler, you know, but they're following, they say they're only following his orders, but, you know, if you're doing evil things, you know. You're right about Nuremberg. The whole thing is seen through um, Nuremberg, evil on trial as part of the title of the movie. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 the trials do not resolve, did not solve, did not... Um, did not deal directly with the evil because those guys in the dock, so to speak, uh, who were on trial, uh, some of them were apologetic, but most of them were not. Uh, and as you say, they, you know, they did not really accept blame. Uh, even some of the ones who were executed did not accept blame. They did not accept blame. But, but I think, uh, and the movie did not make much of this, but there weren't a whole lot of them. Uh, altogether, I think it was around 20 mm -hmm. people were tried at Nuremberg. Mm -hmm. um, and of those, uh, something like, uh, oh, I don't know, a, a dozen were actually convicted. But you remember Ben Ferenz uh, was the prosecutor, the young man at the time, just got out of the U.S. Army. He originally came from Germany um, and did a terrific job. But 
You know, the number of people tried was not that great. The number of people convicted was not 100%. And the number of people executed were not 100%. They were less than the number of people convicted. So altogether, you know, this was this was a trial of certainly of note. And the world watched this trial. The world, the world could see these Nazis, um, see their lack of, uh, their lack of, of caring uh, they're evil and um, and maybe the world learns something by that but really uh, it, it, there were there were millions of people killed but only maybe 20 on trial now the german government subsequently uh, in nuremberg and elsewhere tried other nazis because the german government then was trying to make good uh, on correcting you know these these evil things, I, um, and I don't, I don't, I can't give you any numbers on how many there were, how many other people there were who were tried. Bottom line, though, is that um, this is a sort of a view through the keyhole mm -hmm. of Nuremberg, and yeah. it is a view, it is a view, which is a docu series, so that there, there's sixty, maybe seventy people who played roles either as academics who spoke about what happened uh, or as uh, playing playing a role as an actor in the movie well, because there were plenty of uh, you know scenes that were reenacted uh, in black and white and in color and they were accurate as, as far as you can see they connected it was hard to tell the difference uh, between the reenactments and the footage and the footage well, the footage was amazing yeah. uh, you know we have been watching footage of of Hitler's rise all our lives, um, but a lot of this footage you never saw before. You never saw this before, exactly. and it was shocking to see it. Good for Berlinger. He was trying, I think, and I, the reviews say this. We should talk about the reviews. He was trying to show the younger generations in this country and elsewhere um, that you know what happened, yep. and what kind of a what kind of an evil. Uh, empire was involved in the Third Reich. And I think he did that for me, and it sounds like he did that for you. Yep. The big question is wh whether he reached the young people, um, the Generation Z people. Um, and, and if you look at the reviews that are online, it's not at all clear that he did. Yep. Um, but you got to give him credit for making the movie. It, it's yep. an excellent movie. Rotten Tomatoes thought it was an excellent movie. Um, but the the what do I call it? The public reviews, not so good. And a lot of the public reviews, you know, everybody wants to separate this from the obvious parallel to Trump. But the public reviews, in in, in great part, in great percentage numbers, yeah, the public reviews say, oh, this is all wrong, because you know, uh, Trump isn't like that. They made the parallel. Exactly. Um, and and this is all propaganda. The movie is propaganda. I love when people project that way. A lot of people ran the movie down because it reminded them of Trump, and they liked Trump. Totally, totally agree with you to, to tremendous, tremendously that these people, because they knocked the, knocked the movie because it reminded them of Trump and they liked Trump. But you know, getting back for a moment, William Shire was the reporter, and this whole movie is through the eyes of the reporter the American reporter who was there in Nazi Germany. And that made it more realistic. But getting back to what you're saying, I read those reviews too. And those who felt that they don't like Trump, as you said, they like this, this the parallel, the subtly parallels. But the ones who like Trump gave it a one or a zero. They didn't like it because, but it's so, to me, it's so obvious. I mean, Jelly Robal, his... Hitler's niece that he was having an affair with, you know, we think, right? And Trump with these women, you know, the way he treats women, misogyny, I think you have another show you're doing on misogyny, his misogyny, you know? So, I mean, there are so many parallels and Berlinger, he did a really good job with the intent for destroy too, that, you know, the Armenian thing. I mean, that was seven years ago. He did a good job. He made a name for himself in so many crime movies and stuff, won awards. So the guy's really good. He does a good job and he brings this real filming, you know, from that era and then mixes it 
with acting, you know, and the one thing they were able to take William Shirer's voice from recordings he had done and, and AI, they were able to re replicate his voice. So there was so many things, uh, the technology today, what it allows us to do is things that were never allowed before with AI, you know? So really, I, I really felt that even though some felt it wasn't that good, that the, the mix of the, of the real, the real filming and the actors, I think it was good. It, it, to me, it kept me in my, at the edge of my chair, right? To, to six hours plus of, of this. So um, total agree with you. It's from a perception of, do you like Trump or you not like Trump? That's how you're going to review this. I mean, the realization, uh, and I, I, I hate to utter these words, the realization that this could happen again Six million people died, and the brutality of their their deaths was captured in this movie. Yeah, I yeah. mean, it was you know we hadn't seen some I'll of the brutality, young. and the movie really tells you, shows you what it was like to yeah. be brutally murdered for no reason. Ordinary, common folk, middle class people, mm -hmm. taken out of their homes and shops, and murdered in cold blood on the streets in front of their families with their families yeah. uh, you know i mean th this could happen again and you know one of the things that i have worried about in terms of the you know autocracy in terms of dictatorship and and this is something that putin did when he was uh, in east germany with with the uh, kgb um it's the idea about telling on your neighbor okay and we forget we don't think of that the way to divide a community is to set it up so that you can tell on your neighbor and have some ephemeral benefit in telling on your neighbor, and your neighbor is carted off in the middle of the night and killed, disappeared. Mm -hmm. And so what is what is remarkable is that uh, Hitler did that, but people don't recognize, they don't realize, they don't remember that that was all part of the totalitarian playbook. Mm -hmm. um, and so th that is what was happening in Germany. And ordinary Germans were petrified, and, and it changed the way they thought. Um, the other thing is the scapegoat. You know, the scapegoat thing was not in Hitler's original playbook. Yes, he was anti-Semitic. Yes, the people around him were anti-Semitic, but, but they were not trying to do genocide at the outset. It was merely a political tool, a part of Goebbels' propaganda. Yeah. But uh, as time went by, it became a political tool. Yeah. As as Hitler got crazier, and he did get crazier, uh, it became a tool by which you killed millions and millions of people. And and part of the reviews of this movie uh, suggests there's one poll in uh, Time magazine, I think it was, where they found that the um, younger generation um, doesn't know. They yeah. haven't learned about the Holocaust. They haven't learned what Hitler did, the brutality and the number of people who were brutally killed for no reason, innocent people. And, <clears throat> and they have no idea because the schools, George, don't teach it just the way they don't teach properly slavery in the Civil War in this country. And so, you know, kids can grow up and never know about the Holocaust, about Hitler, about the evil in the Nazis and around the Nazis. Uh, the other element, and I think we have, to, we have to deal with this, and he does, is that hmm, this wasn't just Hitler. And it, just, it wasn't just Goebbels. They were reaching the whole country. Germany was pretty much on board. And they didn't know exactly what he was doing, the death camps. Um, but they knew that Hitler was at war. And for a time, he was beating up everybody in Europe. And for the most part, they backed him. One of the reasons they backed him is that, you know, people tend to back a war in a country, especially when they have a leader who's suggesting it's the right thing for everybody. But the other part of it is they were afraid. They were afraid that if they said anything uh, out of order, um, like this happens in Russia right now today, mm -hmm. uh, they would be they would be turned in, reported, so, uh, and, and they would be punished by... God knows what would happen to them. I mean, 
in Hitler's uh, Germany, they'd be sent to a camp or killed. That's what I'm saying. They don't know this. Our younger generation doesn't know this. And, th and therefore, they don't see it as a risk uh, with either Trump or any other autocrat who might step up to leadership. I mean, Stalin did the same thing. He was an autocrat. And, and this it was in the news today, some young ballerina, Russian-American ballerina, she's been jailed for giving $51.80 to some Ukrainian uh, organization to help the, the civilians in Ukraine. So they're putting her, they're giving her a 25 year old, 20 year jail sentence for just doing that for $50, $51 for, 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 to help the poor Ukrainians who are suffering, right? So you had Stalin and then there's whole, th Kristallnacht, 1938, when the, they started breaking all the windows of the Jewish owned businesses. And then January 6th, what was January 6th? That, I mean, you, they literally stormed Hitler, you know, with the Reichstag, with that whole Reichstag issue, right? All these people go and at the Capitol, January 6th, and, and start, you know, breaking into the Capitol. So you've got, so, I mean, the, the parallels are right there, you know, I mean, and as as Trump keeps getting crazier and crazier, as you said, if he gets back in, where is this going to lead to? Because he's already angry. You know, he, he starts ta talking about things that any Jewish person that doesn't support him is not a good Jew, right? And Kamala is not really black. <laughs> you know, she's not black that she's made herself black. And, and there's all these crazy things that he's coming out with every day. And as he's getting more and more unhinged, you know, he gets back in and he's bent on revenge. So where do we go from here? You know, I mean, I mean, every Republican that that has been prominent didn't show up at the Republican convention this year. All the previous VPs, previous vice pre presidents, previous all of his, almost all of his cabinet members didn't show up because they know this guy is, is losing it. I mean, Joe Biden was obviously becoming having cognitive, uh, I mean, this was for the last year and a half, I could see that. But Trump, is his cognitive issues are more like the father that we, you know, we, we, we did the father where he starts becoming crazier and misperceptions. You know, Joe Biden had some things where he forgot, right? But it, remember we did the movie with the father with Anthony Hopkins, who, and Hopkins was wonderful actor. And that's the kind of thing you're seeing with Donald Trump. Angry, rebellious, that's also at, at, attributive at, at Alzheimer's, the dementia in some people. So I, you hit it on the head, Jay. Bottom line is, where, do, where does this go when you have an autocrat that's being, Hitler finally decided he was going to commit suicide. Goering, and no, not Goering, Goebbels, not only his wife, who was another crazy gung-ho Nazi, all her five children, and she, they all killed each, commit suicide with, with Goebbels. So, I mean, when you're that fanatic, right, even life is not important. The, the, the ideology is more important than your own life. This is a really a remarkable moment in, in world history. Um, even even putting the United States and Trump aside, there are autocrats who are on the same path. Oh, right. And uh, as they get um, you know crazier and more powerful, they do crazier things. You know, I saw just uh, yesterday a thing in Medusa, which is a published yeah. by a bunch of journalists who were in Lithuania because yeah. they ran away from Russia. Exactly. <laughs> and they were talking about, this is really scary. They were talking about what what Putin is doing with some of the people who criticize him. He renders them to a psychiatric clinic. And of course, <laughs> it's not really psychiatry. It's just a way of muzzling them and burying them and never letting them out, ever. It's not legal process. It's just medical process. It's psychiatric process. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very scary what he's doing. And so it's you know tantamount to the kind of brutality uh, that existed in Germany in those days that you could not run away, uh, whether you were Jewish, in which case he was going to put you in a camp and gas you, um, or if you're an ordinary German and you spoke up against him.
So <clears throat> the answer is uh, that we we see signs of that when when Trump talks about vengeance. He's really talking about dealing with the people who criticize him. So if they didn't show up at his at his party, um, they're on his list. You know, it's out of the Mikado. I have a little list in the Mikado. It's humor, but this isn't humor. Um, he he has got a lot of people he's going to settle scores with, just like Hitler did. Bottom line is, you so precise that we are dealing the, what Berlinger did very subtly. He brought to the mind of where we're at here and all the other autocrats, Orban and whomever else, you know, Erdogan, I think I consider him an autocrat, Putin, right, Orban, so many others, and Trump, you know, and Trump makes no, I mean, he's very obvious about how he feels. He doesn't cover it up at all. He says that he's going to get revenge, you know, if he gets back in. So can you think of, he's got his little list. Nixon. Nixon had his enemies list. That's not America. We forgive. We move on. We have like these honopono things like they had the day after the election here, try to get everybody back together because we're all one one party in the Democratic and one country. I mean, there were Republicans I respect, like Huntsman, you know, the moderate Republicans. You're talking about another time, but we, we're, we've moved on since that time. We have a, a different Republican party, a different MAGA That's party. Right. That's um, right. We have a different Trump, and um, right. you know this this movie, whether you whether you make the association mm, sui sponte yourself, yeah. uh, or yeah. whether you know you read and you find that other people are making the association, including people who are for Trump and against Trump, it's inevitable. It's inescapable um, that this movie will remind you of the emergence of dictators everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes a, a very important movie um, because it shows you things that you didn't think of. It shows you how, uh, how, how Hitler did it and it gives you the playbook that he used. And when you think about the playbook, it sounds kind of familiar, at least up to this point. So it's really educational. And oh, you have okay. to give Berlinger, Joe Berlinger lots of credit for tackling this, he did a good. Uh, it's a it's a very ambitious movie, six part series. That's ambitious, with uh, seventy actors involved, yeah. and all the people, the academics he talked to, yeah. including Shira's niece, yeah. who actually was criticized, roundly criticized, in the uh, comments um, on 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 the uh, internet. Uh, what does she know? They said. Well, actually, she's his niece, and she had his papers, and she is a valuable resource. So, I mean, any kind of criticism that these guys could come up with, they they laid it on this movie. That's what we have here with Donald Trump. This whole MAGA movement, it's a cult of personality. I mean, that, and he's, you know, all his antics, I don't know whether he, if he learned these or he read Mein Kampf, but I mean, the parallels for in Mein Kampf and the parallels to this whole Hitler's rise, I noticed it immediately. There's so many different things that sh show that, right? And 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 Berlin, he didn't really. I mean, he presented it, but he didn't really push it. You know, it's you have no. to make the decision on your own. But for me, it was so obvious that we're dealing with the same kind of sh BS with Hitler's rise. This is different, isn't it, from the Civil War movie that we reviewed? Yeah. And the Civil War movie, um, that's fiction. And yeah. it's um, you know, a sort of a fiction extension right. of the notion of a divided country right. and taking taking it to some extreme that you know we haven't thought of before. And you know, the ghost of Christmas future. It's scary, but it isn't necessarily the reality. It could be, but it isn't. Um, this one, this is different. This, this is an historical yeah. examination of yeah. what Hitler did and the people around him and the people he killed and how he, you know, essentially destroyed uh, civil society in Germany and so many other countries. Um, so this is this is different than the Civil War movie. Both of them are scary, but this is history. And it's as, as close as you could get to history in a movie of this nature because they're following William Shira. 
who was a reporter and who wrote the dispositive book um, about the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Yeah. Um, so it's it, it, if it's scary, it's actually more scary than the Civil War movie was scary. Most definitely. And, you know, I remember there was a film that I presented to UH uh, Outreach College about Stalin, what he had done. People were f- disappeared. They would feed them to the dogs. Right. Anybody who, who opposed him. Right. And and Stalin was similar to, to Hitler and, and all these other autocrats. Like what you were saying, people disappear. They are meant if they're in a mental institution, or they just die. Navatni, and then who was that other couple? The the man and his daughter. They shot them with some kind of poison. You know, Stalin. I mean, Putin. So this is the his Soviet Union, Russia. It's the same story that's been going on for over a hundred years with how you deal with uh, uh, people who are opposing you, right? So. Mm-hmm. We really have to be very careful that we don't end up like these other places. And this Berlinger has really done a good job to open people's eyes. But these young people today, they're dealing with, they're not really, I mean, I was a history teacher. And, and you know, one thing I better say, Susan Menzer had gone to Brandeis. She was my history teacher, she, uh, AP history. She was very good. But they really, she, they really didn't emphasize the Holocaust. They just sort of brushed over it, right? This was like in the fifties, right? In the early sixties, that they really didn't talk about this. So you had to go and research all this stuff yourself. And these st- students in school today, they have to bring these autocratic regimes and you know the whole Hitler thing, rise Hitler, to their attention. So that these young people will be aware of what could possibly happen. But bottom line is this is a bad, this is a very good move. They should put these this movie should be in history classes in all these high schools in America. The thought I had, George, while I'm looking at the movie and reading up on it, it's that there's a lot of people in this country who went through their entire education, never learned about the Holocaust. Right. They don't know about it. Some something over sixty percent, according to that survey, yep. of the people yep. who, who of the young people in this country, don't know what it is. They don't know that six million people were killed in the in the Holocaust. Yeah, um, and it's just kind of remarkable. But let me say that um, that when you when you have people who don't know, who never got taught, what what is the difference between that? And the people who do know and deny, you know, I think I think ignorance is denial. And and we have a society in large part, more than a majority, that is denying the whole thing. They're denying the whole thing. And therefore, this movie is very important because it goes upstream on that sort of thing. And it tries to teach people what happened and what the history is and and to encourage them not to deny it and not to be ignorant about it. You so I, I, I'm I'm thinking that there should be more movies like this, but I'm also thinking that people will criticize movies like this. They will use these movies to deny, to call it all a hoax, um, as, as, as Republicans under Trump do. Um, and it's really sad to find how limited our understanding of historical events uh, is after all these years we have sort of shoved off from reality. Being Armenian, you know, I, I have the same issue with my own family that was wiped out, you know, killed. So, so you know, and then I've talked about Dr. Meyerstein, our family physician, who was Akamai enough to get out with his German wife and his daughter in '38 on the Crystal Knock Times. He got the hell out of there right before the. Sh- Blankly, you know what hit the fan, right? So I mean, I mean, when you come face to face with a Holocaust survivor, right, who was educated, who was a f- physician, right, who knew what was going on, right, and he explains the whole process. You know, it's so real when you're dealing with a real person than if you're just dealing with a, you know, abstract what happened, right? So, so Holocaust survivors, they're getting in their eighties, nineties. They should verbalize what they went through. Steven Spielberg has this thing called the Shoah Project, 
Exactly. Where he took footage of them telling it, their stories. See, anyway, let's go back to let's go back to our show. Yeah. Um, what's your rating on this movie? Oh, 10, 10 plus. You know, ten plus. I I really like this because it's bringing reality. And when the filming, the the you know the films that they've colorized, right, brings that era into play, and then the actors that play with that. Berlinger said that his family came both from Jewish from both sides in the 1850s. His family was had come from the, in the 1850s to America. So none of his relatives died in the in the Holocaust. So when he was growing up in Stuck Scarsdale or wherever in Westchester County, he really wasn't that aware of it, you know, until he started looking into it. So so I mean 10 plus because it it's very, very important for the young people today and those who deny this to see what actually happened. And this movie gets step by step into how Hitler from this schlub, right, painter, was able to, to get to the point where he was able to kill millions of people. I mean, you know, it could happen here. It could actually happen here. And people are oblivious to to, to how things well, they go. are. I give it a 10 plus also, George. I'm with you 100% I mean, on that. And I think Rotten Tomatoes would likewise give it. And and I think that people should watch it. I think it should be um, a kind of a wake up call yeah, about yeah. what is going on around us. Yeah. And we should learn about what happened because, you know, the old, um, the old uh, comment is if you don't remember history, yeah. You will be doomed to repeat it. That's what this movie tells us. That's and precise. ignorance is no excuse. Well, thank you very much, George. George Kaysen, you, yeah. uh, movies you can learn from. We'll be back with another one soon enough. Aloha. Aloha.